we are grateful for the blood of Jesus Christ, by which we have access to stand in so phenomenal a grace from God. And today we're looking at some of the things we've been talking about last Sunday and um, for the previous week. And I want us to tackle a few things. We want to deal with childhood issues. Yeah? It's not good to open a sore and not heal it. And so we want to pray therapeutically into our past, into our lives, and any residuals from yesteryear, from even the womb, or even from ancestry. I'm not talking about the crimes or sins committed, I'm talking about the afflictions that shaped how we are. Many of us have personality issues, I do, so I'm the first to put up my hand to say that. And it can affect how you live your life and it can affect how useful you can be to God. So this is why Saul could not enter Damascus as Saul. This is why Jacob could not enter Canaan land as Jacob. This is why Abraham, or rather Sarah, could not have a child until she came into the promised land. And then she became Sarai or Sarah, properly and so there's a new you that I believe you are becoming acclimatized to recognizing that that prospect is a reality that can emerge from within the old you hallelujah and we want to speak to that many of us have been through serious rejection serious affliction at a tender age molestation um, bullying at school, uh, teachers and even parents talking down at you as if you were inhuman or non-human or subhuman. And these things can affect us significantly. Please can I get a witness? It's not the easiest thing to admit and sometimes we're the last to see it because that's just how we are. Um, so you find personality disorders like just abject rudeness and sometimes that's an inferiority complex masking a superiority. Rejection sometimes can bring out a timidity in a person. The Bible says God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Or it can manifest as callousness. And God wants you to be bold, but he doesn't want you to be arrogant. He wants you to be confident, but he doesn't want you to be proud. Um, otherwise, if you are timid, like David should have been, um, he would not have been able to walk up to the battlefield and say in front of all the generals who should have been ahead of him at taking the option, the opportunity to bring down Goliath or even walk into the king's war tent and say, I'll take him down. And when the king gave him armor, he refused the armor. How do you refuse the king when he gives you the best armor in Israel and gives you his own sword? How do you do that? You have to have a boldness. And if you were not primed for boldness by your parents and your village, meaning the family that raised you, you may not have innate boldness that was given to you by God at a tender age. And many times we are disorderly. We, are, we have what you call personality disorders. And then, then you have also um, other disorders that predispose a gender in a lustful way to the other gender uh, because of the absence of that gender as a parent in their lives or perhaps even as a bully in their lives. So it may misorient a person where they have a non-biblical orientation to sexuality. And these are all very serious issues. And we're not tackling them for the sake of tackling them. We're tackling them because we recognize that we have been shapen by our life from inside the womb all the way to right now. But the good thing, Isaiah 43 verse 1, if you have that, can you put it on the screen? What, what he simply says is God says, I created Jacob. And he's not talking to a singular man now. He's talking to a nation. Hallelujah. He's talking to a nation. I created Jacob. And I formed you, O Israel. I shaped you, Israel. And because I did that from ways back, when you were one man, not a nation, don't be afraid, for I have redeemed you and I have called you by your name. 
Your daddy and mommy called you supplanter, supplanter, 419. But God says, I called you by your name. What's his name? Israel. That means you see you as a singular person. But whether you realize it or not, people coming through the funnel, the expanding funnel of your life in the descent, meaning your descendants, whether that's biological or whether that's social or whether that's industrial, it's, it's going to be an enormous group of people that come out of your loins. Many have already have. Hallelujah. You have impact on your workers' department, on your unit, on your siblings, on your juniors, on your aburos. You have significant impact on them. And it's, it's critical that we understand that when God wants to shape you, he's really not shaping only you. He's shaping your descendants. Adam failed before he sired his children. Adam was God kind. He was man, but he was God kind of man. But after he fell, he did not produce God kind seed. He produced mankind. That's why Christ had to come to restore God kind. Hallelujah. Can you get that? So we want to pray now about our past afflictions and how they may have shaped us. You'll meet people who have um, a very deep timidity or you'll meet people who have a brazen callousness. That's a personality disorder. You'll meet people who have an unbased or a baseless superiority complex. It's really inferiority because they were made to feel inferior by circumstances in growing up and it may have been a whole complex on a family, on a tribe, now on a nation. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. Molestation and bullying, they're very serious issues. But look at the beautiful thing. The God, the God of heaven says, the stone that the builders rejected has become the chief of the corner. Why was Jacob chosen and not, not Esau? Rejection. I'm going to talk for a few more minutes and then we pray. Why was he chosen um, and not his brother? Hear, hear this out carefully. In Genesis 3.15, God said, I'm going to put enmity between the woman and say, the serpent. And I will put enmity between the serpent's seed and the woman's seed. And in, in the translation of the Bible, in the correct sense, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. But, but the seed of the serpent will bruise the heel. Now a heel will heal. When you crush a head, the enemy's power has been taken or his authority has been taken from him. But look at what the enemy was looking for. He knows that his arch enemy that will ruin his plan to take over planet Earth, to take over your life. And you know, he governs the populace of the world. He's called the God of this world. That's important to understand, otherwise you'll misunderstand and underrate him. From that point on, he started to look for the seed and every seed, male child of a woman born from that time that was in the lineage of Seth, he went after them. That's why Cain killed Abel, because the devil filled him, and he wanted to prevent the seed, which was either Abel or in Abel. You get it? And you follow him down the line, he sees that a great warrior is born, and he wasn't killed. He tried to have him killed. This is Moses. But God preserved Moses. So Moses is a type of the seed, but he's not from the right tribe for the seed. By the time you get to Abraham, Abraham is carrying the seed. We know that because when he put the seed in his wife, her dead womb, 90 years dead, it came back to life. Isaac wasn't supposed to be the carrier, but God flipped the script and took it from Ishmael, or didn't allow it to land on Ishmael, and it landed on Isaac. Then it comes to a tussle between Esau and Jacob, and because Jacob was the one carrying the seed, that's why from the womb he was rejected. 
He attacks wombs. He attacks the seed in the womb. He attacks the seed even after it's born from the womb. Hallelujah. Now, you don't realize how much you are like all of them who carried the seed. But if you are a Christian, the seed is in you. The Christos. The Christos, the seed of the woman is in you. Now, seed of the woman is not a usual term because a woman normally doesn't have seed. Seed is a male possession from his sacks. That's unusual. We want to tackle that this morning because the seed wants to express himself as the new you. You must not go into 2025, even July 24, without discovering, that is uncovering, who you really are by the name God calls you. We're wrestling, um, and the stakes are high. They're very high. I don't know who's not. If you're not wrestling, do lift up a hand. And wrestling is a grip and throw sport. It's a grip. Somebody's gripped you, you've gripped something. And it, it's a contact sport. So when you consider where Jacob is, um, he's, he's challenged. But consider this. His mother goes to God because she feels her life is threatened because of what's going on inside of her. And he says, why is this happening to me? God tells him, tells her, it's because you have two nations, not two boys, not two babies, not two clans, not two families, two nations. That's scale. In other words, God doesn't deal with you or the seed in you by the singular. He sees far beyond the generation in which you birth one. He's seen generations beyond where the one will become many. Do you get it? And that's what he's concerned about. Now, remember that the seed of the woman is not in Esau. God had programmed it genetically that it will be from one sperm. It will be in Jacob. Now, Jacob is rejected by his dad who flaunts his favoritism about Esau. And this puts uh, East, Jacob in a, in a terrible plight. So he could feel unworthy, but his mother takes care of him. Jacob is a hunter, outdoors man, so he's constantly out there depleting his stock whilst Jacob is, is building his stock in the yard, the yard in the back. Don't, don't grow your stock in the far fields. Grow your stock in the backyard. Because the day you need to present your venison to the blessor, you don't want to spend a whole day looking for it. Jacob was spoiled for choice. He had kids from the goats, he had rams, he had lambs. And when the call came upon him to get what he needed to get, he was ready and on time. Let me deal with something. Somebody shout, it's rightfully mine. It's rightfully mine. Esau comes back from hunting one day and he's hungry or he has appetite. And he says to Jacob, I am so hungry, dude. I need something to eat. You know that lentil soup we had last night or yesterday? Can I have some? Because he called it the same red stew, same. That means he was familiar with the pot. You know how we cook a pot and it lasts a week? You know that, you know how we do that? And um, he said, I won't give it to you. The boy was smart, unless you give me your birthright. The birthright was just the right to the blessing. The blessing has three dimensions. You've heard me say it before, but I want you to get it. The blessing of succession of the patriarch. Number two, the double portion. That means everybody else will get one portion, but, but the, blessing, the blessed one will get two portions. And number three, the priesthood or um, leadership and the priesthood, because king and priest was essentially going to be one in this covenant, and it was foreshadowed in that covenant. And Esau despises it because of the temporary pleasure of satisfying his physical need. That's why the Bible says, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. That hatred is taken in context between the enormity of the love for the seed and uh, the love he has for Esau feels like hatred because in scale, they're completely different. It's not that he hated Esau. He just, comparatively, there was no premise. Esau got blessed. He got mightily blessed, if you read your scriptures carefully. But God's making a point that 
Satan, get thee behind me, for thou savorest the things which be of man and not of God. You have to love the things of God. You have to like them. You have to deeply appreciate them and recognize that life does not consist in the stuff you have. It consists in who God is in your life. So Esau has lost the birthright. That means though his father does not know of this transaction, otherwise he would never have given it to Jacob. It was now rightfully Jacob's two witnesses. Number one, God had said so from the womb. Number two, Esau had sold it in a transaction with Jacob. So it was rightfully Jacob's. But there was a deception involved. The deception is that Jacob deceived his father into thinking that he, Jacob, was Esau. This complicated the blessing on Jacob's life because he got the blessing. God blessed them. And then he commanded them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, um, and then subdue the earth. You will have dominion. Jacob had that. Jacob absolutely had that. He was productive. He multiplied his produce. Um, he filled the space that was the then known world to him. And then he subdued it. And he walked right into dominion. But it was complicated because it was sitting on Jacob, whereas Jacob was not God's design. And so there was a dimension of sorrow associated with Proverbs 10, 28, the blessing of the Lord. And that blessing does not mean blessing from God. It means the blessing of God himself, meaning God is the blessing. Think about that. If you have God, take everything from you. You got everything still, because he owns everything. That's the key thing to have. David had the blessing of God. Saul wanted the position, but David wanted the blessing of God, the blessing that is God. So the presence meant everything to him all the way up through his life. Of course, things get complicated when the blessing brings all kinds of benefits and blessings into your space other than the blessing himself. And so we have this challenge. He walks away with the blessing. He has to run because he's in trouble with his father, his brother, and he's going to meet his uncle who's more crooked than him. You know, Dave, Jacob was a crooked guy. His mother was from a crooked stock. His mother's family were crooked people. I mean, crooked, cunning. And God is too protective of his purpose to allow you to stay the way you are. God says to Jacob, I love you too much to leave you the way you are. I love you too much to leave you the way you are. That's why he pulled his hip in the wrestle, in the wrestle, so that Jacob could not but hold on to God anyways. And God says something very profound. The day is breaking. We'll talk about what day means tomorrow. It's breaking. Let me go. Because the day is breaking. It didn't say a day was breaking. It said there was a focal point to the day God was referencing to Jacob. The day is breaking. Now, Jacob didn't go and look for the fight. The fight picked him. He didn't pick the fight. Stay with me. It, tell your neighbor, it's you the pastor is talking to right now. I didn't pick my fights. My fights picked me. They hid behind friends who became enemies. They hid behind, behind circumstances that looked like blessings. They picked me. And if God let them pick you, it means he knows you can win. <laughs> Jacob beat his daddy. He won over his daddy's choice. He beat his brother. He beat that crooked Uncle Laban in all of, some people say 14, some say 21 years. 
He prevailed against all of them, and now he meets another guy who's picked a fight with him. The only problem is that this person who's picked a fight with him is the God of purpose, but he's disguised as a man. He's Christ pre-incarnate, masking as a wrestler. That problem in your house is God wrestling you. That situation in our financial problem, all of us, is God wrestling with you. That situation with how do I break through, it's God. He's wrestling you. A night is not a period of the sun isn't shining where I am. Night is any time in your life where you can't see your way out, up, over, or through. Where you have a dream, but you can't see how to manifest it. I have dreams, and a very little one amongst them is that building next door. I can't see how, yeah? But the day is about to break. Oh, the day is about to break. And the day can break for you, and it can miss the next person. Because you still got your eye patches that you sleep with on. You haven't turned on the light yet. But in this case, the light is going to find you. So let's deal with this. Let's deal with this. The fight picked you. That means you can win. Never let go of God. Rise to your feet if you can. Never let go of God when you're wrestling. Because you think it's the country you're fighting or the system. It's more than that. God allowed the system to fight you, but he's in control of it. In all things, ultimately, your wrestle is with God. And I want you to declare this to God in your own way. I want you to really pray. God, I sense your presence in my life, especially when we come together in the presence of two or three in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And I want you to make a commitment to him. I will not let you go until the authentic blessing, not the Jacobean blessing, but the authentic blessing is not just sitting down in my life, but anchored from the root of who I really am in your eyes. That I will not let you go until you bless me to be what you shaped me and created me to be. Not what I want to be, but what you make me want to be till all my wants are aligned with your wants. I won't let you go. And this means that it's about here that you tell you more than A, B, C, D, E, F, G, your whole alphabet of the things that you like. I like you more than mother and father. Can't follow Christ without that. I like you more than everything and everyone that you like. Let him know he has first place. In fact, he's not first, he's more than first. He is preeminent, that means more than first. He's before first. That means he's all encompassing. I don't want God to be first in my life, I want him to be more than first. And it has to be a heart cry. And you know, sometimes you don't even believe God until you shout about it, until you cry about it. God, God, I want you first. I want you before first. And tell him the things that you like. And tell him, I want to like you more than all the things that I like. And tell him that, look, I have five senses. And my five senses are open 24-7. Help me to open my spiritual sensitivity. That I'll be sensitive, sensible about you. That I'll be sensible about you. I want you... For my feet touch the ground, I want to be so consumed in you, consumed by you. For I get up off the bed before my eyes open, I want to be dreaming about you, God. I want you to be my eyeglasses through whom I see everything and everyone. 
I want you to be the lens and the compass of my life. I want you to be the center and the circumference of all I am and hope to be. I want you to own me completely. Make that your declaration this morning. Own me. You bought me with a price. Help me to not hold on to personal ownership of myself. Own me. Own me. You're, you're finding these innovative ways to tell God, I will not let you go until you bless me. It's just really saying, God, I'm never going to let you go. I want you to be my blessing. about a minute to really talk to God on the level on the level on the level person to person you don't need to be do it in King James King James can make you very inauthentic speaking a language from 500 years ago that you and I don't even really understand say it in the language that you speak to your wife or your husband or your children in or your father and mother in Say it the way you would talk to a father that you deeply refer. Tell him your life is not over. Do you know how old Jacob was at Peniel where he wrestled? He was 97 to 100 years old. When he stole the blessing from his father, he didn't steal it from Esau, he stole it from his father. He was 77 years old. There are few of us who are that age. None of us here is 97. God hasn't even started with you. He hasn't even started yet. What he will do in the remaining of your decades, years, scores, it has yet to be told. The earth has not seen the kind of it. God's going to do something that's going to shock your world. When I was a day only, hardly anybody called me Paul. I had no idea that Pastor Paul was inside that guy. I had no understanding that the Metropolitan was inside that guy. I wonder who's inside of you wanting to come out, not wanting to be shrouded by a name your daddy called you, when God has a superior voice than your father. I want you to round up your prayers in the next 15 seconds. I want to deal with something called voices. In Jesus' name. There are voices and there are voices. But there is the voice, and they all can have impact in shaping your life and how you see things and how you understand things. Have you ever been in a place where somebody walked up to you and said something so negative to you? It may have been a deliberate insinuation or innuendo, and it cut you to your marrow. And it shaped the way you were thinking either about your health or about your life or your career or your future. That was a voice. My sheep, Jesus says, the Almighty says, they know my voice. The voice of another they will not hear. Write it down. You must today learn which voices, and really all voices of God are echoes, except when he is talking to you directly, sometimes and often through the echo. You will not say it. Lift your right hand. I will not say it with emphasis. Say it from your belly. Hear the voice of any other that is not accurately speaking for the voice of the Almighty God into my life, lest I be shapen or named or be defined or labeled by another crucible. In the name of Jesus, I declare it a reality in my life. 
If you believe God heard you and that you heard you, I want you to clap your hands. Clap your hands and shout with the voice of victory. That means there are conversations that you will have where something that was designed by the enemy to maim you, lame you, hurt you, you'll be able to say, no, that's not for me. And like David was told he would be delivered to the fowls of the air in a few moments, he had to counter it there and then. You have to learn how to deal with those things. Otherwise, things people say, things people innovate, and the innuendo, the, the things they put in you, they can shape you. Shape your whole night, you start dreaming about what they said. Or they just start talking about cancer, and you start feeling like you have cancer. Or start talking about poverty, and you start feeling like I'm going to be broke and bankrupt. Have you ever had that experience before? You have to recognize that. Now there's the voice. That voice you want to hear. That voice is your protection. That voice is your compass. That voice needs to be constantly having the benefit of being tuned in to what God the Holy Spirit is saying. That's important. Otherwise you will minimize your possibilities. The voice pulled his hip joint and said to him, dude, let me go. Of course, Jacob was holding on, let me go because the day breaks. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Voice to voice, heart to heart. God was speaking from his heart, his commitment to the two people he promised something in Genesis 3.15 speaking from that heart through the reaches of all eternity passing through time until it meets eternity again he was speaking promissorily he was speaking prophetically that's how God speaks to you he speaks as a prophet and he speaks as an apostle he speaks to build into you what he's saying to you should I say it again he speaks to build into you what he's saying to you he's speaking to you what he wants to do that's prophetic. But he's also speaking it because his words are building blocks. They build you. Hallelujah. Voice builds you. It shapes you and it builds you. He said, I won't let you go till you bless me. This is what God said. He said, who are you? The biggest existential question that you will ask yourself. Who am I? Who are you? And even Jesus had to ask that question of his disciples. Who do I ye say that I, I know who I am. I am the son of, that I the son of man is. So he knew who he was. But he couldn't achieve what he wanted to achieve if the people who were going to represent him after he had gone didn't know who he was. He wasn't aiming at the populace. And the populace gave him a good definition. You're a prophet. But it wasn't accurate. He was more than a prophet. They said, you're like Jeremiah. You weep and you cry prophetically. You're like Isaiah. You have the periscope into the future. You're like Elijah. You're your prem premier. He said, thank you for the people's opinion. But what is your definition of me? You have to have some real people in your life who can see two dimensions of you. That's Ananias. They see two dimensions of you. They see who you are in your present day, but they also can see what God told Ananias. I'm sending him to kings and to Gentiles. Take that. I'm sending him to kings and to Gentiles. The faith was with Jews at the time. So he could deal with the two persons. The evolving and the evolved. Because otherwise Ananias would have nothing to do with Paul. Who would then was Saul. Yeah, we're almost done. I'm going to extend you by maybe 10, 15 minutes at the most. But if you have to go, no problem. 
I mean that honestly. And you'll need that in your life. I want you to pray about that. I want to deal with voices. How to shut down those voices so you will not hear them. And don't go looking for those voices. Don't go looking for those voices. Evil communications, that's voice. Corrupts good behavior. And once you have a taste for the voice, it's difficult to lose it. You want that thing the way God talks to you. And in which atmospheres. I have some friends, when I'm with them, we both, or three or five of us, hear from God in a way that we don't get it on our own. That should begin to tell you who your friends are. And that atmosphere should begin to tell you who you are. That voice is your life. Man shall not live by gugura and ekpa, paycheck and salary, a car package and this and that, but by every word that proceeds. Proceeding word is not logos. Proceeding word is voice. You've got to hear his voice. They didn't have scriptures. Abraham didn't have scriptures. Paul didn't have New Testament scriptures. He had to look at Old Testament scriptures, but his greater, greatest reliance was on the voice of the Holy Spirit within him. When all he had was scriptures, he was misdirected. They had to pray that God would stop him. And God didn't only stop him, he turned him around and made him one of them. And then took him from the bottom of the pile and put him at the top of the pile. The worst of sinners became the strongest of Christians. You get it? That's the kind of transformation God wants to do in your life. So you're going to deal with voices now, and I'd like you to pray as peers in this prayer that help my sister, help my sibling in Christ to never hear the voice of the enemy and take it to heart. Give him or her defenses that you build in that she, he will learn how to not receive the voice of the enemy, whether it's coming through spouse, house, family, pastor, preacher, because they're all human. Let every man be a liar and let only God be true. Make that your prayer. Pick up a pair. You have just two minutes. Praying with your neighbor after that, you'll take a minute to pray for yourself. When you pray for your neighbor, you're praying for two of you, for you and him, or you and them. You and her, you're praying together. You're praying the same thing for yourself as you're praying for them. Your sheep hear your voice, the voice of another they will not hear. Not they should not hear, they will not hear. One of the signs that you're a shepherd, or rather a lamb in the flock, is that you will not hear it, the voice of another. Begin to round up your prayer with your neighbor in 30 seconds. In Jesus' name, somebody say amen. Lift your two hands and please pray for yourself. The Father, the voice of another. I will not, not I, I'll try not to. 
No, I hope not to, but I will not. I set my will in order with your will that the voice of another I will not hear. Be my filter in every conversation, in every sermon, in everything that's ever said to me. Be my filter. Your voice is my sense of direction. It's my pathway. Your word is a lamp to my path and a light uh, to my feet. Your word is light in my soul. Your word is luminous to my destination and my pathway to get there. Your word is light to my next steps. It's light to my map, to the plan that you have over my life. And I don't want to just read it. I want you to say it. I don't just want to hear it from human beings. I want to also hear it from you. I want to witness from heaven and the witness on earth. So when my preacher says it, I want heaven to resonate inside of me and say, that's my voice. That's my voice. That's my word. The Bible says the seeing eye and the hearing ear, the Lord has made them both. That means sometimes God will speak to you in pictures. Pictures are a voice. The Bible says, or people say that a, 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 a photograph says a thousand words. So don't rule out the seeing eye. It's, it's, it's the same sense as the hearing ear. In Jesus' name, I want you to speak in tongues strongly right now, very strongly, as if you're fighting something, as if you're beating something back. But the voice of the wolf, you will not hear. The stranger that causes divisions and offenses, a mark be on him. But he will never be able to carry out his enterprise. The spirit of Absalom, we break it now. The boy almost ruined Israel by a voice at the gate, by a voice at the conference room, by a voice in cabinet. He almost ruined Israel. Would have made a murderer out of his father. Wretched Absalom spirit. Just 20 more seconds. We continue to pray intelligently. Shibra Husiki. Shibra Kosa Bragazidia. Shibra Kosa Bruka Dagarabagra. Digiria Bruba Jagiriato. Your Prakaskidas. In Jesus' name. Somebody shout your biggest amen. Do you really want what you have prayed about just now to be your reality? If so, on the count of three, muster yourself. Say your biggest amen. One, two, three. the sound of victory in your life. You can have more victory if you give more sound. You can have more victory if you give more sound. Listen up. Jacob heard him whilst he was wrestling. He heard the voice whilst he was wrestling. How do you wrestle and hear at the same time? That's what you have to master. Painfully, I'm learning this because I'm wrestling everywhere. I'm wrestling within and without. I'm wrestling in close quarters and in far quarters. I'm wrestling. I'm speaking to you as a comrade in battle. I'm wrestling. You've got to be able to hear the voice of the only person you can really guarantee loves you, 
loves you totally, loves you unconditionally, and he has your back no matter what. That's grace. What did he say to him? He said, who are you? He didn't call him Jacob. He could have said, Crook, who are you? But he didn't call him Jacob. He did not call him Jacob. He said, who are you? Identify yourself. Yes, sir. We have identity issues. We're shaping in another identity. All of us. All of us. He said, Jacob. What does Jacob mean? Surplanter, surpasser. That's what it means. Always wanting to surpass others. That's not your game. That's not what your game is supposed to be. I don't want to be better than you. I just want to be the best me I can be. Whether that's better than you or not, really, I don't really care. I want you to be the best you that you can be. Because until you're the best you that you can be, you won't be jealous of me and I won't be jealous of you. We all need to be the best we can be. And when I find best, I shouldn't burn down the university. I should help you to find your best. If you find your best, please don't burn down the university. Show me how you did it. That's exactly what I'm going to do now. Do you understand? I can't stand all these breakaway chokers who plant a church next door to you and you could kill him. David could have killed Absalom. Could have killed him in one shot. Wouldn't have taken him four words. But David left town because of him. He didn't want to kill his own son. He said, God, you have to judge this one so that when it is done, they will know what happened to Absalom. He died. He died. What happened to Ahithophel who empowered Absalom? Because David did some wrong things, but it still didn't give legitimacy to divide Israel. Do you know what Israel means? God's prevailing prince that prevailed with man and he was ready to fight God until he saw it was God because he thought it was just another man wrestling him. Do you get it? That's why Israel is strong today. They live in the midst of their enemies. They lost their land. God gave it back to them. If you count five world powers, you have to count Israel. Some people say if you count three, you have to count them as one. You are Israel. You are Israel. This is what you want God to tell you. I need to hear your voice, Pa. I need you, I need to hear your voice. My pastor's voice is not enough. My friend's voice, I need to hear your voice. And I need to see the majesty of your might, the might of your majesty. And if you're asking me a question, what are you doing to me? When I know you are the omniscient, the all-wise God, what are you trying to do to me? That's like me asking you, what is 1.25 times 1.25? Because God is really saying, do you know who you are right now? Have you started to entertain who you are going to be? Jacob came to terms with himself. He said, I'm a trickster. He said it himself. And he knew what Yaakov means. He knew it himself. I'm a trickster. I tricked daddy and I got the blessing. I was cunning with Esau and he gave me the right to the blessing. So I didn't feel there was anything wrong in going into dad and saying, give me the blessing. And I faked I was him. I'm not Jesus Christ, neither are you. But he tells us that when we go to the father, we should go in the name and in the cloth of Jesus Christ. That's why God didn't take that out of the story. But there was something missing, the blessing. 
from his father. It made him rich, but it added sorrow. There was always this nagging thing that my father's voice got me the blessing, but it didn't cure my problem of rejection. That's why we started with rejection. That's how we started dealing with that. I'm missing something. I have the car, but I'm driving in it, but I'm missing something. I have the wife, and I'm loving on her, but I'm missing something. And she loves me too, but I'm missing something. I have the kids, but I'm missing something. I have some zeros. I could use more, but I'm missing something. Can anybody identify with what I'm saying to you? People look at you and they want to be like you because you look like you have everything, but they don't know that they you don't they don't know that they have more than you. You may have more stuff, but they might have more God. Because there's a chance that when you get more stuff, you might lose some God. As in you losing your sensitivity to Him, you don't lose Him. He's always going to be there. He was following Jacob around the whole space. And he said, all right, enough is enough because the first of April, it's not April Fool's Day, it's God's day. This is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I hope you're hearing me. I need you to talk to your father. He's here. His presence is here. He's asking you the question, who are you? Really, really, who are you? Really, who are you? Who are you really? Are you Absalom? Are you Amnon? Are you Adonijah? Are you Saul? Are you Simon? Who are you? Really, who are you? He's not asking for the name your parents give you. He's asking for the name that you have shaped towards. And if you can hear him, I want you to tell him the truth. This is a quiet therapeutic moment between you and your God. You are the only person who loves you completely and totally. Are you broken by something that happened to you in your infancy? Or whilst you were a teenage girl at school? Or were you molested? This is between you and him. Or do you feel that life gave you a bad hand? And so it's your right to go and be a hustler. God didn't create you to be a hustler. He created you to be a receiver. No man receives 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 anything except to be given to him from above what he got in his daddy's bedroom his daddy would live over 40 years after he gave him the blessing he got that by taking it he didn't receive it but what he got on the mountain of Peniel when he was face to face with God Peniel means face to face he received that he wasn't even looking for it Who are you? This is a private moment. It's a great time to close your eyes and to talk to God. Ask yourself and ask him, who am I? Not all prayer is shouting to God, crying out and proclaiming into the atmosphere. Real prayer is not what you say to God. It's what God says to you. Now you're really praying. Who am I? Where can I be not just better, but best in my character, also in my charisma, also in my sensitivity, also in understanding who am I? What did you make me to be? What am I supposed to be? What is my calling? Who am I? If you find that, you won't have to heal who you were, you get rid of him and exchange him for the new you who is whole, who is Christos expressing himself through the peculiarities of your vessel. Who am I? I am because you are. Peter said you are the Christos, the son of the living God. God's about to show you his son as your mirror image. He's dressed up in divinity, but you are like him. 
divinity, but dressed up in humanity. Who am I? That's the question. And you can respond by saying, Father, show me who I am. Don't let many days pass. Don't let many hours pass. Give me a real glimpse that I can photograph and imprint. In my photo data page, in my head and in my heart. But I'll keep looking at that. That I'll know one day soon I will be all of that image that you allowed me to glimpse. And some of you, as you answer the question, you're going to hear the answer. Real prayer is a conversation. Otherwise, it's not really prayer. It's like a madman talking to himself. When you know that you know that God listens and his ear is not deaf, and that the Almighty hears you and that he will speak back and he will tell you or show you who you are. Listen carefully, he said, you are no longer going to be called Jacob. That means I'm not going to call you Jacob. And I'm going to do something in you that with time, people will not call you Jacob anymore. They'll, they'll recognize you to be a person who prevailed with mankind. But you one God. One God. You obtained God. Our chief pursuit, David said, is one desire. That daily I will inquire in the holy, holy place of the Lord. I won't try and jostle and say, please send me here. Please do this with me. Please do that with me. I won't jostle and try to trick people out of their job. I won't serve in another man's place and, 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 and undermine him. No. I don't want what belongs to somebody else. I want mine. Lift your two hands and say, Father, show me who I am. From D day forward, help me to be sensitive to D day. If it, if it is today, help me to seize its opportunity. If it is tomorrow, make me ready to take it. Show me who I am, not what I can get. Not what I can have, but show me who I am. Because when you are who you are supposed to be, everything you can get, you won't have to struggle for it. It'll be naturally you, a tree, once it is grown, it will bear fruit. A fish, once you throw it in water, even as a baby, it will swim. A warrior, put him in the battle. Even though he's going as a butler, he'll win the battle, asked David. This is what I want you to spend your quiet times in the remainder of this fast. Partly saying, God, show me me. Show me who I am. When he shows you, tell him, wow, really? And then remember that you're going to grow from that day forward do you have extensions, expressions bearing fruit regularly in the new you may Jacob bear no fruit anymore may your Israel alone bear fruit with your permission only I have one more prayer I'd like to tackle do you permit me Thank you. Jacob was 97 when this happened to him. David was 15 or 16. One was set in his ways. The other was still tender enough to be manipulated by the skillful potter's hand. That's why Jacob had to be broken. David was just shapen. 
But he was rejected as much as Jacob was, maybe even more. He was the Omota, the son of maybe a different woman. So there was something in the polygamy of his family that they did this to him. And when they make you a rejected person, you start wearing a billboard that says, reject me. So rejected people behave in a certain way that says, reject me. Whether you've been jilted by the, the girl who you wanted to marry and she said no, or the guy who wanted to marry you and then he turned around and said, I'm not doing it anymore. Or jilted by a father or mother uh, on a job or an application uh, or any of those things. And if you're not careful, you start wearing that as a badge. Rejected people reject people. Hurt people hurt people. Accepted people accept people. And so... David is rejected, but he finds a new friend. He's the one who writes that God, the son, is not ashamed to call us his brothers. David wrote that before the cross. This boy lived with the cross in view. He was messianic. Nobody taught him but a private relationship with his heavenly father. Rejection did that to him. Use your rejection. Don't curse it. Use it. It's pushing you to God. I told you the other day, all rejection is divine redirection. If you have a heart for God. So in his faithfulness, he's wrestling, but he's faithful. Possessing all these feelings of rejection, wanting his father's affirmation. Write that word down. Affirmation is important to me. It's very important to you. It's very important to you as a parent and as a person, as a child of God and as a father or mother to your children. And look at this in his faithfulness, and I'm cutting it short. God shows up in his house, in the voice of a prophet, and says to the father, one of your boys is the next king, not of Jesse, not of Bethel, but of all Israel. One of your boys is the next king, and he's got a big sacrifice with him. And that's his pretense, so that Saul cannot accuse him for going to anoint a new king. Saul can only accuse him for making a sacrifice, and that's never a bad thing. <laughs> Sorry, that's never a bad thing in Christ. <laughs> yeah, are you with me? And look at what happens, look at this carefully. They get through seven boys, you know the story, rehearse it in your mind, and the lineup is finished, because David was rejected. They did not want to call him. He wasn't in the lineup. But this is the power of divine selection. When God puts his hand on you, in the backside of where you're blowing kisses to him, on the hillside where the flock are uh, eating at the pasture, and God puts his hand on you in private, he's gonna do it in public. And your publics are in layers. This is one public. We are your public. But there are many more layers. And God is always going to increase your exposure to the layers. Just be faithful. Don't cut others. David in his whole life, he never cut. Only enemies. Yeah. And they now have to go and look for him. They lost the application and they were refused. And one of them had to go get him. Your enemies will come and present you to your crowd. You hear what I'm saying? And don't think your enemies are these faraway people. Your worst enemies are never far. They're near. And look at what they did. This is God speaking to you. He said, we will not sit down until it comes. That's custom for the king. They had to wait for David to sit before they could sit. Samuel started treating him as the next king in his family, master it there first. And then he sat down and they anointed him with oil. 
The anointing that makes kings. The king maker came to the house. If there's anything I would love to be, I don't want to be the king. But I, I really would like to be a king maker. For, for those who are stuck in the backside of nowhere, lost in obscurity, wondering how can, how can I always be the subject of victimization? I want to be the kingmaker to that kind of person. That's who this church attracts. And you know the story, David's sitting there with plenty of oil, you know, Ururu on Luther's head, and me Ururu. And he's thinking they're going to send the royal Uber to take him to the palace to sit on the throne and get the crown immediately. He's a boy, he's going to think like that. But Samuel went straight back home to Ramah. And then David realized, well, he just, God just insulted all his older brothers. God just insulted all his older brothers. And he thinks that they're going to say, hey, your majesty. You, you know, they didn't say that. Because when he eventually went to the battlefield, he said, So even though they anointed him with the oil, his brothers were not going to accept that. That was just another man putting oil somewhere. <laughs> but the anointing does not lie. Yeah. It doesn't lie. It doesn't lie. It takes its time, but it doesn't lie. And when it's ready for step one, you will get step one. But step one is not yet the crown. And he's going to, because God knew, if, if I put you next to the king now, and he throws a javelin at you, I know you're going to pick it up and throw it right back, and you won't miss. He missed because he's not an expert like you, but you won't miss. So you go back to look after the sheep and stay there until you receive it. You won't have to take it. You just receive it. Did you ask someone to anoint you with oil, mm. David? Mm. Did you say, please anoint me? Mm. And you can bet that number four was saying in his heart, Father, let number one miss it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And number seven was saying, uh, please, if number one, two, three, four, five, five, please let number six miss it to follow me. When it hit number seven, God said, no, I have rejected him also. In their minds, ye, shape boy or more tiny. You, you understand? And he walks in and he gets it. That's what you call receiving. Yeah. It's not taking. Yeah. You face God. God will put you in position to receive. But the difference now is the back of the sheepfold, he has a kingly anointing. Meaning that in this jungle, I am the lion. So lion, when you come, you will respect me because I am the lion. You, you get it? So when the lion came, David found something that was only momentary fear for a split second. Boom, the anointing came on him. It happened twice, once with a the lion, then with a the bear. The witness was established. Let everything be established in the mouth of two or three witnesses. And he's still happily going around shoveling sheep down. His father then sends for him. He says, this battle's been on for 39 and a half days. You get there real quick and find out what's happening. Because we heard that there's a giant saying we can't fight in this battle because you know the, the valley, um, you know the story, do you? Yes. Do I have to explain it? Okay, so I won't explain it. So they reduced the fight to a single combat. Single combat is this, it's, mm. it's wrestling. You get it? It's wrestling. Don't wrestle with what you can't beat. Mm. Don't wrestle with what you can't beat. You have to use some long distance weapons. You can fight in the background of your closed door in your house. You can beat it from there. You don't have to engage him or her. Lob it, shoo. Sling it, You get it? And he says, Dad says, go to the, the battle and present these cheese sandwiches to the commander and find out how your boys, your brothers are doing and come back and give me a report. David arrives as a servant. He wasn't trying to win a battle, mm -hmm. but he was already a warrior. Yeah. You become a wife before you marry. Mm -hmm. 
Otherwise, you married wrong. I'm not saying he was wrong, but you are not yet mature. You become a husband before you marry. You become a winner before you go to battle. You understand? You become before you do. Yeah. Trees bear fruit. I hope you're getting it. Yeah. I hope you're getting it. Because now you have understanding. You can pray and declare accurately. And he arrives at the battlefront. And he sees what's happening. He says, how come? You guys are Israel. We've just dealt with Jacob. So you understand what Israel means. You are prevalent. You are prevalent people. It is your God-given hidden nature or expressed nature, whichever you prefer. You are Israel. How can you lose? You have a covenant of victory. And he's saying, do you not know who you are? They had the problem. They did not know who they were. So they were shrinking in front of an uncircumcised Philistine, no covenant with God. Then the covenant with God was a cutting of the foreskin. I hope you're getting it. And the man, the king in him stands up. He's not yet crowned, but he's king. He's winning battles for Israel, but he's not yet crowned. So he's already king, but he's not yet king. You have to know that about you. Otherwise, your time away from the throne is going to frustrate you. I don't need to be in number one position to serve. I can serve from wherever I am. You get? And then he's talking that this doesn't need to happen. This is not how it should be. We shouldn't be cowering and, 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 and degrading our rights. Citizen abuse is not right. You understand? He's, he's frustrated by it. He says, he says, I can do this. I know I can do this. I have two witnesses in my resume. And his brother talks him down, doesn't hear the voice. Because that's a strong voice. Your brother's voice is a strong voice. He goes to the king. The king talks him down. But, but he, he's desperate. He's going to try anyway. He gives him his coat, puts it on. And David wears the coat. Can you imagine how, what it must have been to tell the king of Israel? The king is talking to the king. I can't, I can't, I can't win this way. I can't win this way. With this, I can't win. Listen to me, kings. God's going to show you old stuff that because you are new now, you can use old stuff in a new way and it's gonna do bigger things than you ever thought it could do. Amen. What is that in your hand? This is an existential question for your partner, your staff. He asked Moses, what is that? He said, it's my stick, I know this stick. It supported me all my life. It's still gonna support you all your new life. And it's gonna make rivers red is going to release weapons of mass destruction against your enemy. David, David, boy, it, yeah, this stuff is expensive, but I, I don't know how to use this. It's one of the signs that your kingdom has come. And he gave it back to him. He said, don't worry yourself. I can take it on. This is a boy, 16, like that, like our drummer, the young guy. Yeah saying, don't worry, I got this in hand. That's what I want you to pray about. That you don't take Saul's armor. I'm slowly pushing away my King James. I still use it, but it doesn't speak to me in the language I understand. There are many traditions of our fathers that we take and we imbibe. They are impeding to God's anointing in your life. So you have to know how to know the difference between tradition and truth. Otherwise, you'll be using antiquated ability in a situation that, depend, that demands the authenticity of who you are and who your generation is. You get it? Let's deal with that. Let's deal with that. What do you mean, deal with that? It's a simple prayer. Lift your right hand and say, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father. help me to recognize that the day is soon about to break. I knew this 
because this is the darkest hour I have ever been in. And it is said in Maxims uh, that the darkest part of the night is always just before dawn. Father, I recognize this in my own life. And because the time is imminently upon me, take a license and do with me as you want and make me into the vessel you want me to be that you may glorify yourself and your son through the rest of my years and days and decades and scores on this planet. In the name of Jesus, whatever you do, don't refuse to anoint me. I am the rejected one, but I want to be the one you use. And you have the liberty. Anoint me with fresh oil. What builders would not use, a master builder, use me. Use me in the sheepfold. Use me in Aja. Use me in northern Nigeria. Use me anywhere you want to use me. Take me wherever you want me to go. And I want you to just say, have your way in my life. Now speak in tongues for a few moments. And as you speak in tongues, they didn't ask to go to the city of London. David didn't ask to go to the city of New York. David didn't ask to go to plush opportunities. David said, take me wherever you want me to go. And he went right back to the sheepfold. Went right back there. And at the appointed time himself, God used the father of his house to send him to a battle. Not as a warrior, not as a champion, but he sent him to battle as a steward. Of stewardship it is expected of men to do their best. And he arrived there in the designation of steward, but a warrior is always a warrior. And the fight had picked Israel, and nobody was willing to stand up in Israel but the boy David. Hallelujah. And that day that he stepped up to the battle, something happened. Somebody shout in Jesus' name, amen. amen. This is what happened. I have to close right now. And this is what happened. David went to the battle. He went with a stick, a little boy with five smooth stones, and his slingshot. Old weaponry. David was not a hand-to-hand -hand combatant. He was an artillery officer. He's an artillery soldier, I should say. And that meant his fights were not won in close proximity. He would only come at you in close proximity when he had weakened you. And he took his slingshot. They had a battle of words. I can't deal with that now. After the battle of words, they had a battle of instruments. He slung his instrument. These slingers could hit a moving bird in the height, in the head, on the eye. They could, they could, precision is the word, they could hit, get the pebble into the little gap in the warrior's helmet for eyes and nose, that T point. They could do that at 100 yards, 100 meters. That's what David did. He took a spot in between the two eyes or on the forehead, and he knocked Goliath down. Goliath went down. I'm heading somewhere. And when he went down, David did not run away from the battle. He needed to know, I'm not just knocking this guy down. I'm taking no prisoners. I'm killing this guy. And he sliced his head off. I believe David did it in one slice. He looked at the blade, did like this to it. He said, wow, this guy was going to kill me. I will not let him live. And the little boy with an audience of generals. Even Saul was peeping out of his war tent. And David went, he probably lifted him by the head like this, by the hair, and did, and the head rolled. David picked it up, sword in one hand, his testimony in the other. Listen, listen, the affirmation his father would not give him. The affirmation his seven brothers would not give him. The affirmation that because they did not give it to them, nobody else would give it to him. A prophet spoken to by God came to his house, that's what I am to you today, to tell him, watch out. I'm still in charge of this whole thing. And listen, the whole nation, especially the women singing alto and soprano, Saul has killed his 1,000s with melody, but David has killed his 10,000s.
And they were in uproar. You know why? All the women would have been raped, murdered, um, joined into the Philistine harem. Um, that's somebody's mother, somebody's sister, somebody's daughter. All the men would have either been killed, emasculated, or taken as slaves. And they were all excited about this boy. I promise you, Eliab, the oldest brother of David, found a way to find his tenor. <laughs> He found a way, I promise you. The whole nation gave him affirmation. Listen, there's a day coming in your life where those who refuse to give you affirmation, with loads of others are going to come together and they are going to affirm you. Because David, you never got it wrong. You never got it wrong. You, know, you didn't kill or cut or backstab your leader. You didn't do that. You didn't try to undermine. So when it's yours, there'll be nothing in your harvest to kill your harvest. Amen. Hallelujah. I want you to thank God that your day of affirmation is not far away. And he was not just being affirmed as a legitimate son. He was being affirmed as champion of Israel, a step in the process. Even the king had to say thank you. Even the king had to say thank you. There's a day of affirmation coming and it's not far away. Amen. Father, for these kings who might not fully recognize or realize that there's a champion in the child. There's a king in the kid. There's a Paul in Saul. There's an Abraham in the father of Ishmael. That you would say to Abraham, even though Ishmael was a grown lad, that take now your only son, Abraham. There's an Abraham in Abram. There's a rock in a pebble. There's a Peter in Simon. There's a champion in David and a king too. Father, let this day be the day of light these remaining seven days before we break this fast may be the day of light that up from the wrestling bout though limping Israel emerges from the cemetery of Jacob and Paul emerges from the knockout of Paul emerges from the knockout of Saul and Peter comes from the transfiguration as a rock, one upon whom God can build his church in every generation. Father, bless us to know who we are and whose we are and to never forget it and to always rise to the role. In Jesus' name, listen carefully. If David thought he was the child in that battlefield, he would have never taken on Goliath. If he remembered the voices and the pictures painted by those voices of his brothers, especially the oldest one and his father, he would have never seen himself as doing more than serving sandwiches. But he heard the voice. The voice became his best friend. And that voice would always answer him. That's why he wrote so many songs about the voice. The King of Glory. May God bless you. Amen. Let's see, before I leave this sacred desk to go back to my sacred desk at home, I want you to imagine something. How did that once broken boy feel when all Israel, from Elah to whether the home city was Bethel or Judah, how did he feel? when the nation in sustained anthem gave him and his God affirmation. Write that word down. Affirmation is coming to you. Yeah. And there are only a few steps between you and affirmation. You will know what they are. God will speak to you. Once you be and do those things, you will get massive affirmation from great voices but ultimately from the voice and when the voice speaks he can turn a whole city to favor you and he can turn a whole city against your enemies 
Hello, friends. Have you ever felt like life is throwing too much at you? That the mountains are too high, the valleys are too deep, and the fiery trials are far too fierce? Well, now, the Resurrection Holy Week has a message for us all. Even the darkest Friday leads to a bright Sunday. It's only on Sunday that Friday makes any sense. Think with me for a moment. From the heartache of Good Friday to the brilliant joy of Resurrection Sunday, there's a powerful truth that our toughest times do lead to our greatest victories. The Bible says that Jesus' resurrection on Sunday was a demonstration of God's power to usward. There's a message for us right there. Friday hurts, but Sunday is coming. Friday was alarming for everybody, but Sunday was affirming, especially for Jesus Christ and his followers. This Resurrection Sunday, March the 31st, come along to the Rock Cathedral, Lecky Lagos. My theme is, only on Sunday does Friday make sense. Let's together celebrate the reality of the resurrection. It's about turning heartache into hope and grief into gladness as we learn how the resurrection of Jesus Christ's transformative power can breathe new life into our own stories. The time is 9 a.m. You can't make an impression to the Rock Cathedral? No worries. Join us live on YouTube or Facebook, and here's where you can find us. The links are right here below. This Resurrection Sunday, let's embrace the new beginnings and victories that Resurrection promises. Trust me, you will not want to miss this celebration. Can't wait to share this special Sunday with you. My name is Paul Adefarasi.